question. Who is Jesus Christ? Uh, this is going to be our central question as we delve through this tonight, both looking at the chronology and the history, as well as looking at the archaeological evidence. Um, there's been quite a bit of recent archaeological evidence that's come to light in evidence of the Bible, including evidence of crucifixion from here in the United Kingdom. Now, that's some really fascinating stuff, perhaps more applicable for Easter time, but it still really does show the history of Scripture in a brand new light. And I've actually got some artifacts right down here next to me, which I've got a separate camera hooked up to, which we'll have a look as we go. All right, I'm going to start. I mean, yes, I know it's Christmas and we're talking about Jesus, but I can't help but slip a little fossil in. Um, John, I believe this is actually one of your fossils uh, over in Australia. Is that yes. correct? That's uh, so Jason. That's... We had it at a homeschooling conference, you may remember, mm -hmm. and we asked the kids what it was. And one kid said, I go fishing with Dad. I know exactly what that is. We catch them down in the bay. So it's not only uh, ancient in the eyes of even evolutionists, because it's one of those that's been around forever and a day, that yeah. skate shark uh, still lives in the harbours uh, down in Victoria. Yeah, we call it a, a like a guitar fish or something like that because mm. it's shaped a bit like a guitar, right? Um, we've actually got a, uh, uh, well, I say a living one. It's a, it's a modern one. It's a sort of a preserved one, but it's, a, it's, it's not alive anymore. But we've actually got one in the museum because I'd quite like to get hold of one of these for our museum collection eventually because, as you say, John, they are indeed living fossils. But you see our question there? Um, John first introduced me to this question. Who wrote about this fossil fish first? The answer was Eusebius in 325 AD. Okay, who was Eusebius? He was the Bishop of Lebanon. Well, that makes sense because these fish come from Lebanon. In fact, there are lots of fossils come from Lebanon. It's quite a famous place. And he said in AD 325 about these fish, we have received confirmation that the flood rose above the highest mountains. In our day, the fossils of these fish were discovered high up Mount Lebanon thus providing evidence that the old story of the flood is credible. Those who hear this may believe it or not. Fascinating talk. Not only were they finding fossils of fish, in fact, these fish fossils even smelled, right? They still had soft, gooey stuff in them that when you would crack open, it would stink. Not only were they finding fossils of the fish way back in AD 325, they also claimed that these are the, res the results of Noah's flood. We know because he wrote about this in the Chronicle of Eusebius, the Bishop of Lebanon, in AD 325, translated from the classical Armenian. I mean, do you realise how important studying the history actually is? But you notice one thing. We're in AD 325, and he's accepting the biblical record for the earth and explaining the world around him based off of that biblical record record. How old did Eusebius think that the creation was? Well, he thought it was 5,611 years from creation to the taking of Rome by the Goths, and he did not live that long after that had happened. So he thought that the earth was somewhere between five to six thousand years old when he was alive. Interesting. I mean, he didn't believe in millions of years at all. Now, if you've listened to us and particularly listened to last uh, week's presentation, you'll know that the idea of millions of years is by no means a new idea. It's by no means a new ideology. The ancient Babylonians were already believing in millions of years. The Hindus translated that from millions to billions to even trillions of years. And the Greeks certainly believed in a version of evolution over many millions of years as well. But here is a man, despite being surrounded by pagan cultures who believed all of this, he firmly believed that the Bible was true, and he believed that the earth was not actually that old. I mean, five and a half thousand years is pretty old to you and me, right? But certainly not very old compared to the millions of years that was pushed at his time and the millions of years that is being pushed today. What's all this got to do with Jesus Christ? Well, it's got everything to do with the age of the earth and who Jesus Christ actually is as our Lord and Saviour. Let me give you an example. Um, today's date is December the 17th, 2021, or December the 18th, 2021, if you live in Australia, because it's times like this, right? Um, of course, according to the Hebrew calendar, today is the 13th of Tevet, 5782. 
Ah, 5782, that's from the creation of the world. According to the Hebrew calendar, the world is still less than 6,000 years old. Interesting, there's still a group of people today whose their calendar system is based straight out of scripture, straight out of the Torah, and it is less than 6,000 years old. Okay, why does this actually matter? Uh, we deal a lot with the age of the earth. We deal a lot with, I mean, we could have gone on and talked about John Calvin and what he believed about the age of the earth, Martin Luther and what he believed about the age of the earth. We can have a look through scripture. We can have a look at the fossils. We can use brilliant evidence from stuff like soft tissue, right, about how young the earth is. In fact, we even spoke about uh, a young universe in the sense of this wonderful meteorite that we've got from Africa, right? And we're looking forward to all of your donations of meteorites as well. But why does this actually matter? What's this got to do with Jesus Christ? And what's this got to do with Christmas time? Well, you know this book, right? It's the Bible. It contains the Old and the New what? The Old and the New Testament. Testament? That is a legal term. As in your last will and testament? Yeah, you've got to understand that the Bible is God's legal dealings with mankind. Um, it's the Old Testament, it's the New Testament, it's the testament of God to man. It's the record of God's legal dealings with mankind from the creation to the fall to the judgment and to the New Testament a saving grace. Of course, Scripture talks a lot about testaments, and it talks a lot about legal things. Um, you see, testaments will deal with inheritance, your last will and testament, right? And it has to be historically accurate, otherwise they are invalid. I mean, if great aunt Bertha dies, and she ends up leaving her entire multi-million pound estate to the Battersea Dogs Trust, you know for a fact that her descendants and relatives are going to do every single thing that they can <laughs> to make sure that it doesn't go there and it comes to them, right? And they will get a lawyer, and they will go through that last will and testament with a fine-toothed comb. And if they can find, hang on a minute, the Battersea is actually spelt wrong, there's one word missing, it doesn't quite fit here, this date doesn't line up, then it's going to be null and void. Um, interesting. Not only do testaments deal with inheritance, not only do you need to be related, there's a relation thing that goes on there, but your testament must be historically accurate, otherwise it is completely invalid, from a legal point of view. Um, Matthew 26 Christ speaking here, for this is my blood of the what? The New Testament, a new legal contract. This blood of the new legal contract is shed for many for the remission of sins. Here is a new legal contract, it is signed in blood, and it's for the remission of sins. Paul there, or sorry, we don't know that it's Paul, uh, but the author of Hebrews then takes this one step further and makes this point. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Um, until great aunt Bertha has died, her testament means absolutely nothing. Her money stays firmly in her pocket and her bank account, right? Um, it is not until that that person has died that that last will and testament actually becomes valid and it can be distributed out. Ah, there must be a death of a testator. Can you see where we're going with this? I mean, I wonder if you can start to see how it all lines up with the age of the earth. Interesting. Of course, there's also a, uh, another type of legal dealing in Scripture. That's adoption. Romans 8.15, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You know, <clears throat> my church in, uh, in Norwich has quite a number of families who've ended up adopting children. And I can tell you, 
time and time again, you see uh, the story of the first time that that adopted child called out mummy or called out daddy. And I've seen people in tears because of this, right? It's a beautiful thing when you not only get your child, right? You're legally now uh, this, not just this guardian, but you're legally now this child's parent. But the first time that they call out mummy or daddy, it's almost like there's a, you know, emotional connection there as well as a legal one. It's absolutely beautiful. We have both here. Not only are we now legally bound to Christ, we are also able to cry out, Abba, Father. There is an emotional and a legal connection in this adoption. Of course, the Bible also talks about inheritance, Romans chapter 8. The Spirit itself, it says, bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We've become adopted. If we're children, then we're heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, Christ being the Son of God. Oh, Diane's just dealt with that. If so be that we suffer with him, we may also be glorified together. Not only do we become legally adopted, we are able to become legally adopted because there is a legal contract as the result of the death of the testator. And as we become legally adopted, we then become co-heirs of Christ. We become joint heirs of Christ and we become heirs of God. We receive that inheritance. Um, Jesus in the New Testament uh, Jesus's testament, the contract, the legal dealings concerning the family inheritance must be legally and historically accurate, otherwise it is invalid. Just as the way that our laws happen today, and by the way, most of our laws, certainly in the Western world, are based directly out of scripture, including the laws of inheritance, including the laws of adoption, and they all have to be historically accurate, otherwise they're invalid. You see, Jesus Christ has to be legitimately descended from Adam and Eve, otherwise, ah, um, well, his death means absolutely nothing at all. If Jesus Christ is not related to us, you see, there has to be a relation there. That's a Levitical law. You have to be related to the person that you're trying to redeem. And unless Jesus Christ is related to us, then there's no way that his death means absolutely anything in the slightest. Only descendants of Adam can be saved, and only a descendant of Adam can actually do anything about our sin. Jesus Christ is both of those. You see, Scripture records a real history of real people. Diane dealt with that. Miracle mothers, right? Real history of real people connecting Adam, connecting Eve to Jesus and beyond. You also find that as out of created perfection, the first Adam sinned, continual judgment came down the earth in the form of the flood, the Tower of Babel, the nations and the tribes. And the last Adam, Jesus Christ, is the one who actually made that new legal contract, the New Testament here. Huh, interesting. This is not only a real history of real people. This is a real history of real redemption. Hmm. One missing link. Let's tie this all together, right? A legal contract, a legal dealing. What's this got to do with the age of the earth? What's this got to do with Jesus? What's this got to do with Christmas? Ezra chapter 2, verse 60 to 63. And the children of the priests, Habiah, Koz, Brazilii, they sought their register among those who were reckoned by genealogy, but they were not found. I'll give you a little bit of historical context. The children of Israel have just been let back into the uh, promised land, back into Israel, Judah, the Palestine, the area where their forefathers came from, the area which they'd been taken out of captivity, carried by the Assyrians and the Babylonians. The Medo-Persian Empire had let them go back in, right? Famous story of Nehemiah. Let's go build up the walls, right? Well, in the book of Ezra, Ezra went back to establish the priesthood. And he took with him the Levites. The Levites were the priesthood, right? And you had to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that not only were you a Levite, you had to prove that you were legitimately able to be of the priesthood. And here we have these three people where they had a problem. 
when they were sought their register, when they tried to find, oh yeah, we know you're descended, they could not find a missing link. <clears throat> their, somehow their great grandfather had lost the link when they'd gone into captivity. They were no longer able to prove without a shadow of doubt due to this missing link that they were of the priesthood. And what does it say later on? Therefore were they as polluted put out from the priesthood. They were missing one link. They could not prove they'd lost their birth certificate. And as a result, they'd been shoved out of the priesthood, unable to participate in anything to do with the temple, in anything to do for the remission of sins or the sacrifice on behalf of the people. They were chucked out of the priesthood as polluted. Are you beginning to see the connection here? Who is Jesus Christ? He's our great high priest. Hebrews talks about that over and over again. He's the great high priest. And as our great high priest, as the one who's actually able to be there mediating between God and man, as the one who's actually there, uh, you know, taking our case to God, the father, the great judge, as the one who actually came and died for our sins, as the one who needs to be not only related to us, he also needs to be descended from Adam. Christ's family tree is extremely important. That's why the two Gospels, Matthew and Luke, actually start with a genealogy. Matthew's is there to prove that Jesus Christ was legitimately a king, descended from David. Um, Luke's there is to prove that he was legitimately a human descended from Adam, that he was actually able to be our great high priest. As the author of Hebrews goes on to write, Christ's family tree is extremely important to God. In fact, family tree and uh, historical accuracy is so important to God that just because these three people had lost their father's birth certificate, they were chucked out of the priesthood. Christ, who is our great high priest, must have a full, complete and uncorrupt record of who he is, where he comes from, to prove that he can legitimately actually create a new legal contract. Who could redeem? Leviticus talks about the Redeemer law having to be related to you. I mean, you can go and read about it in Ruth and these wonderful historical characters, right? It's there all throughout Scripture. You have to be related. Christ the priest, Christ the family tree is extremely important. Christ as the last Adam, proving that he's descended from Adam. And Christ as bondsman redeemer. He is actually related to us. You realize if you add up all of these chronologies, you can add up Adam to Noah, Noah to Abraham, Abraham to Moses, Moses to Jesus, Jesus to today. And you get of a figure of the earth somewhere around six to 7,000 years. Now, if you want to argue there are gaps in the genealogies, the furthest you can stretch it is to 10,000 years. Now, that does no help to the theory of evolution in the slightest, so you really don't have any need to do that. But if you want to argue, there, argue that there are gaps in the genealogies, what you are actually doing is throwing the entire legitimacy of Jesus Christ as our saviour into question. Just like those three men at the time of Ezra had been cast out of the priesthood because their inheritance was questionable, you're doing the same to Jesus Christ. Ah, you're on very dangerous and tricky grounds here. Why do chronologies matter? Because Jesus Christ must be provably descended from Adam. If there are errors of fact, errors of history, errors of law, then our inheritance in Christ is null and void. So let's raise some integrity issues before we have a quick look at some of the artefacts. How long did Jesus take to make anything? Who do you realize Jesus created when he came and walked among us? I mean, he turned water into wine. He turned loaves and fishes into feeding, you know. A, a huge multitude of people. He raised the dead. He restored sight to the blind. Ah, he could create things. And he didn't spit. He didn't need a laboratory. He didn't have a magic uh, wand which he could wave and produce lots of stuff. Now, Jesus Christ was the creator. But then don't be surprised. All throughout scripture, you can find Jesus Christ as the creator. Starting in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word. The word who is Jesus Christ is the creator of all things. Colossians 1.16, all things were made by Christ and made for Christ. You see, Jesus Christ did not take time when creating things. He took talent. I mean, he's the creator after all. Ah, 
nothing to do with time, everything to do with a process, and everything to do with a talent. Okay? Skip forward to Revelation chapter 21. And John writes, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, there was no more sea. And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. No more sorrow, no more crying, there will be no more pain, for the former things are passed away. Question, how long will he make uh, take rather to make it? Will he take six days? Will he need to take millions of years? No, it will happen in the twinkling of an eye. He'll just speak and it is created. You see, one thing we know from both Jesus' creating power on earth and his promise for creating power in the future is when you have the right process, you can create things very quickly. This issue is about Jesus' power and integrity. Um, is he really who he said he is? This is about his power and integrity to judge as well. Ah, you will be judged by every word of your mouth. So I warn you today, if you're the person who's thinking, oh, Jesus Christ didn't really mean what he said when he said he was descended from Adam. Uh, you know, he didn't really mean what he said when he recorded the chronologies in the Old Testament. You will be judged by the words out of your mouth and by especially the fact that you are questioning Christ's integrity and his history, as well as his legitimacy to actually be a saviour. Jesus is our creator, Jesus is our saviour, Jesus is our Lord, and he is our coming judge. Who is Jesus? He is the creator of all. Um, make sure you actually worship him for who he really says he is. All right, best evidence for Jesus. Let's have a little look at some of the history and the archaeology, just a fascinating little uh, uh, sneak peek. If you want the full presentation, go and check out our conference that we did last year. It was our last ever session with all three of us. Um, but let's have a little look at some evidence from history for Jesus Christ and who he says he is. I mean, we've dealt with some of the scriptural stuff. Let's have a look at when Jesus Christ was born. Uh, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod. During the time of King Herod? So who was King Herod? I mean, he was called King Horrid in our Star Boy book, right? And you find some wonderful little interesting references to him in there as well. Um, some fascinating little things. Who was King Herod? He's often referred to as King Herod the Great. He was the first of a big line of King Herods. He was the descendant of an Edom. I mean, it actually even mentions it here in the Starboy book. I mean, there's a lovely little uh, picture of uh, King Herod being bonked over the head by a wishful Roman, right? Or him imagining bonking King Herod on the edge. Uh, and it says uh, um, King Herod not being a real Jew. Yeah, he was a fake Jew. He was a false Jew. He portrayed himself as a Jew, but he was actually a descendant of Edom. The Edomites were the descendants of Esau. Ah, Jacob and Esau? Diane mentioned him earlier. Um, King Herod actually worked with Mark Antony to help Julius Caesar. And now we're getting into some real Roman politics, right? And it's usually tied up around one woman, Cleopatra, the Egyptian, right? So you've got a wonderful little bit of politics there. Cleopatra was with both Julius Caesar and with Mark Antony and obviously all the calamity that went on there. Caesar died through a knife in his back. Uh, Mark Antony ended up killing, being killed as well. And uh, uh, Cleopatra and ended up Augustus Caesar. Caesar, Julius Caesar's son actually ended up coming to the throne uh, over the empire and then calling a census. But King Herod actually worked with Mark Antony to help Julius Caesar. But he was very good at switching sides when he wanted to. So you'll find he was actually appointed the provincial governor in 47 BC and he was appointed the king of the Jews in 39 BC by the Senate. And he was involved in deep Roman politics he actually died in 4 bc and this is where we get an interesting little thing that we mentioned earlier how do we know well i've got a a, a coin up here on the screen uh, which we have in our museum collection and it's one very similar to this uh, and there's another little similar one with some little wheat sheaves and i've had a nice little camera set up so you can see a, a nice in-depth uh, picture of it hopefully we'll see if it's uh, if it works in a little bit, but never mind. Um, these are actually the official coins of King Herod, 
King Herod the Great with his stamp on them. Now, the Romans, because of course Caesar couldn't keep hold of everything everywhere, they would actually appoint different people to sort of rule over little areas of the empire and a very few select few of them they actually gave permission to stamp their own coins um, and the most area that had their own coin stamped was actually uh, here in um, Judea. King Herod had his own coin stamped, several of the other governors had their coin stamped, and so it was uh, quite an interesting little thing, but it provides us with great historical evidence of King Herod. It's fairly well established in the historical documents, these little bronze pruters, as they're called. Um, then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all of the male children who were in Bethlehem and on all of its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Famous story of King Herod sending and putting all of the children to death. And then it was fulfilled as what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. Rachel? Ah, oh, Diane mentioned Rachel earlier, didn't she? Uh, Rachel, where's the connection to this and where's the connection to Herod? Well, Rachel was the wife of Jacob, or Israel as his name was known. She gave birth to two of the twelve tribes of Israel, and she was a brother-in-law to Esau, Jacob's brother, or from whom King Herod was descendant. Esau was Herod's ancestor. It's interesting how the Bible all ties everything together, isn't it? Fascinating little study. And when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, um, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose and took the young child and his mother and came to the land of Israel. When did Herod die? 4 BC. He commanded all male boys under the age of two, uh, from age two and under, to be murdered. So therefore, Jesus must have been around one uh, and a half to two at this point, which puts Jesus being born around six to five B.C. Um, why not naught? That would make the most sense, wouldn't it? Well, have a look at the history and where our calendar came from. In 525 A.D., you ended up with um, Dionysus uh, the Little, who was commissioned to make a standard calendar for the Western Church. Now, this is deep into the time of the Roman Catholic Church, and their calculations have been shown to be off by at least four years. It has connections with Easter, and John spoke earlier about Josephus, right? You had the Celtic Christianity, which was kind of separated from the Catholic, never really took on the Catholic ideas, and there was a big clash in Britain uh, between the Celtic Christians and between the Roman Catholic Christians, who actually ended up uh, the Roman Catholics triumphing and the date of Easter being changed. It is all connected to the astronomical bodies, it's all connected to the history, and this Catholic calendar has been shown to be off by four years the same calendar which our modern calendar is actually based on and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from caesar augustus that all the world should be registered now this uh, we've got coins from uh, augustus caesar by the way but this was questioned a lot of time in archaeology was there actually any evidence of these registrars well, who was Caesar Augustus? He was the son of Julius Caesar. And after uh, uh, quarreling and fighting over the throne, he ended up establishing the Roman Empire um, and ordered a census to ensure correct taxes. The census took place every 14 years and it could take years to complete. He had power of all of Rome, uh, despite appointed kings and prefects. And there was very little evidence, uh, plenty of evidence of the sentences, but very little evidence that you were required to go to your hometown until you end up with this document, uh, which is one of the only documents we have regarding these sentences. Um, it was actually, this is actually from the British Museum, right? And it records the request to travel back to your hometown, your home birthplace. Uh, so yes, indeed, there's evidence now that this is what they did, this is what was required to do, so it fits up perfectly with what we actually see in Scripture as well. 
I'm just going to try one more time to see if I can get these coins to show because they're quite interesting coins. And I also have another little surprise which I wanted to show you. So just give me a second. So this is a live feed, by the way. Uh, thank you very much, Sam, for putting up to full screen. So this is actually the one of King Herod the Great. So you can actually see just here, you've got the little grey, the little basket, and you've got these heads of corn which come out of it as well. And it's got the sort of uh, writing around the side. That's one side of it. Just uh, show you the other side quickly, which is where it tells us who it actually belonged to. But uh, also interesting, this is the little surprise. Now, I will just need to get my little torch on so we can actually see what's going on here. Have a nice little look at this one. It's another little bronze coin, and this is one that eluded us for a very long time in terms of the history and the archaeology of it, because this is actually, you can see the nice little sort of shepherd's uh, crook in the middle there. Um, this is actually, get it in the center, the official coin of Pontius Pilate. Um, now, there was a lot of um, argument about Pontius Pilate and to whether he actually existed before they started finding these coins in the records, right? Not only do these exist, but you can find that it's actually one of four um, uh, sorry, one of three different governors uh, of Judea that were actually given permission to mint their own coins. Pontius Pilate was one, there's his coin there. Um, there was another one who I can't remember, and there was also Felix, who's mentioned in the book of Acts. So both of the Roman governors who are actually mentioned in the Bible had their coins minted after their name, and we have collect, uh, specimens of both of those um, here in the museum collection. There's one of the Pontius Pilate ones. Here's another one similar. You can just, the uh, it's a very, very dark coin, so it doesn't show up very well. You kind of got to get the angle right, but you can just kind of just about see the, uh, the little uh, sickle there as well. So wonderful little coins from the time of Jesus, showing that the Bible can really indeed be trusted as an accurate uh, example uh, and record of history.